Next up, we have the uh, privilege of being visited by Sucharita Mulperu. Sucharita is the Vice President and the Principal Analyst for e-commerce at Forrester Research. And uh, we're really glad to have her here today. Sucharita is going to talk to us a little bit about where Forrester sees social commerce going. So uh, please give it up for Sucharita. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Wade. So uh, it is an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I am uh, particularly, um, you know, I think that this is an interesting perspective for me to have because I have been, in a lot of ways, um, a critic of social commerce because so many of the retailers and the companies that, that I've worked with and that I've talked to um, really themselves had had a lot of concerns around things like Facebook commerce and whether or not um, what is typically comprised of social commerce really it's a, it's a revenue generator or not. And, uh, and one of the things that's really interesting and unique about this time that we're in now are so many of the developments that we've seen in the last few months and so many of the changes, in particular with how consumers now have the capability of sharing. Um, that's where the next generation of, of social commerce opportunities appears to be. That's where there is the greatest traction. And, uh, and, it's, and it's a very different story than, than what we've seen before, which is, which is, which is great. And that's what um, Wade spent a lot of time talking about this morning. And I'll step back and give a little bit of a 30,000 foot perspective on, on the perspective that I've seen from the industry and what retailers have shared um, with me. Now, over the last several years, um, there have probably been two primary lessons about social commerce that have come away that I think are very, very good um, bases to have for what is now the new wave of social commerce. And, uh, and then we'll talk about um, you know, kind of the latter part of this presentation being what's new right now and what is it that is so unique and different from what had happened before and why things are more effective than they, they'd ever been. So um, just kind of stepping back and looking at the things that did work about social commerce, because Wade spent a lot of time this morning talking about many of the things that you know, were experiments that didn't quite bear out to be what, uh, you know, kind of what companies and brands had, had hoped that they would be. Um, but really, uh, the, the two big takeaways are, are these. First and foremost, that, that the best customers for any given brand or marketer or retailer really happens on one's own properties. Um, so that happens on a retailer or a brand's own website or their own communities or on their own properties that consumers go to as destinations. And that's really what the data here is. This was um, a survey, a set of surveys <clears throat> that Forrester had done with interactive marketers in the US and Europe asking marketers where was the deepest level of engagement there, that their consumers had had um, across a variety of different properties, whether it was the primary website or whether a blog or other social properties like Facebook or Twitter. And you can see that across the board, the own primary website was a, a far, far distant first with respect to where that level of the deepest engagement really was. Now, when I step back and kind of apply that to thinking about, well, when we, when we think about what is social commerce, social commerce is so much more than simply just a Facebook page or a Facebook store, even things like ratings and reviews. And um, when I had uh, worked with retailers to kind of gather what that picture was, it was, it was a whole series of things. And this is, this is a bit of, um, of a laundry list of, of everything that, that we kind of consider to be social commerce. And, uh, and this was a framework that we had put together to kind of give companies um, a, a way to think about how they should prioritize various social tactics. This is a framework at Forrester that we call our tech radar. And uh, anytime there are several sub-technologies within a larger meta-technology, um, this framework is there to help identify what has the greatest impact and where are various technologies on the evolution of, uh, of of um, creation to, to um, kind of decline. Um, and that's really what the data here is. So there are two axes along the x-axis. It's where is that particular technology um, from the continuum from birth to death, um, you know, based on the fact that there's usually a peak period somewhere in, in between that. And then on the y-axis, where is that technology from an effectiveness standpoint? And we bucket everything into a really, really high level set of, of buckets of high, medium, and low value. And, uh, and, and that's what the high value is, is the, the, the graph, the, the line that is the blue, and then the lowest value is where the red is. 
Now, as you can see, there are a variety of different tactics there, ranging from ratings and reviews to social recommendations, which are the collaborative filtering, consumers who liked X also like Y, that type of sharing. Um, the product sharing on the social networks, open APIs, employee networks, so everything that we could think of mapped along here. Now, if I had to draw a circle around as far to the upper right-hand part of the quadrant as we could get, because really, um, you know, you always in any quadrant want to be on that upper right, it would ultimately end up being these eight tactics. And um, I'm not going to go through every single one of them in excruciating detail because um, you know we could, but um, but I think that uh, you, you know a lot of these are are kind of self-evident. But if I had to take away, a, a, you know, probably the single biggest takeaway for these eight tactics, it is that six of the eight tactics are tactics which happen on the retailer's own site. So again, thinking about those owned properties. So looking back to that first slide about the marketer who said that by and large, our primary website is where our consumers are engaging with us the most. And then looking at retailers who actually have implemented different parts of the social commerce spectrum and looking at what's the most effective, again, it just reinforces that, that the own site, what happens and what starts with your own customers, with your own employees, with people who are visiting and engaging and are your brand enthusiasts where they, they, they are, that's where the biggest impact is. Now, there are a couple of other elements that are, that are outside, um, the, you know, kind of the site, things like microblogs, which are essentially the Twitter feeds, um, social shopping aggregator sites, companies that are third-party aggregators of, uh, of user-generated content. But for the most part, everything else is about your own consumers or your own employees creating content um, or creating some sort of, uh, of information or data that then gets circulated through a social network or some sort of a social feedback forum that then ultimately adds value back to that retail site. The second big lesson that, that social commerce really for the last several years has kind of, uh, you know, kind of come forward with is, is how important sharing is to the equation and how important the peer-to-peer -peer aspect that Wade had talked about is to what is social commerce. And uh, this very specifically was data that I had um, gathered from online shoppers. I worked with the BizRate Insights to actually pull this information. So the reason why the BizRate Insights part is important is because they essentially do post-transaction surveys of people who have just completed transactions. So this, this is several thousand people who are recent online shoppers talking about their attitudes toward social commerce and, and toward uh, you know, kind of sharing their product, their favorite products on social networks. And I'd actually gone into this research hypothesizing, because remember, I was the skeptic about social commerce, that people don't really care about products that get shared, that you just kind of ignore them, or that you, in a worst case scenario, you just kind of unfollow that person, or you decide that you're going to ignore what they say. And the exact opposite actually surfaced in the data, which was really eye-opening to me, and, and I think is probably one of the, the biggest reasons that companies like Pinterest um, have really exploded in, uh, in, in recent months, which is that most people, or a significant portion, I shouldn't say, you know, kind of most, it's not quite over 50%, but a lot of consumers love to see what their friends like. And they like to discover things. They like to discover products, sales, promotions, new, you know, new trends through what is sharing. And in fact, when you look at the negative comments, they're relatively small. The percent of consumers that are agreeing with statements like, oh, I ignore these updates, or I don't like these posts, is, is a significantly smaller percent than the percent of consumers that actually find themselves engaged with the process of discovery. So to be able to, to, to really hook on to those two nuggets, the fact that it's about your own owned properties and the fact that people like sharing and people like what their friends share, that's really where the, the, the big insights with respect to, well, well, why did we have challenges with social commerce over the last few years and what's so different about what's now? Now, what I will say is that we have had you know, some, some inklings and some beginnings to the, to, the, to the share capabilities. That's what the Facebook like button was all about. And, uh, and this is a lot of, of the reinforcement of what Wade had talked about earlier. But really, um, you know, I'll just kind of 
you know, reinforce that and, and share with you a little bit of my perspective as to what it ha what what has and hasn't worked over the last few years. And with respect to the sharing that's happened to date, um, while it has been effective in that it is one of the it was it was regarded as one of the the top eight social commerce tactics, um, it was still limited in the capabilities. It was limited in its distribution. And the four things that really limited it were that one is the just the the the, the sheer nature of the parameter of what you could share. And in fact, um, you know, for the most part, the only thing that you could really do with Facebook was was just the like. Um, and the like was was certainly something that is uh, you know resonated with with millions and millions of consumers. But the problem is that it was still relatively flat, wasn't customizable, and really had a lot of issues, particularly with brands or retailers or any company that perceived itself as not necessarily wanting to be associated with Facebook or they didn't really see themselves as a brand that would be liked or a product that would be liked. They wanted to have more dimension um, and, and up until now, they didn't really have that capability of, uh, of having something that was, was more unique. And you saw some of the examples earlier of, of how that richness now exists. Um, what that ended up doing is that also limited the volume of sharing that ultimately happened because you not only had constraints around how many sites were willing to do this type of activity, but you also, from a consumer standpoint, only gave consumers that one parameter to like it. Um, there weren't other things related to potentially wanting or um, you know, kind of giving more dimension to uh, aspiring to something versus uh, you know, kind of simply liking. The third piece um, was that ultimately that has an impact on discovery. And if you don't have as much sharing, that obviously limits the number of people that then um, get exposed to this particular product or this particular brand or this particular uh, message um, through, through any type of a discovery process. And the fourth piece is, uh, is that data collection was significantly challenged. And we'll spend some time talking about the value of data and the numbers and what all of this information can ultimately yield. Um, but the reality is, is that a significant part of what frustrated marketers about a lot of what was social commerce version one um, was that they didn't even really know the level or the activity of, of sharing that was happening. There was not a lot of great data around who was sharing or what, whether that was even ultimately yielding sales. So, so all of that, um, it, you know, kind of fed on itself and and you know, kind of created an inkling of something with promise, but really wasn't the home run that uh, that we were looking for in the social commerce world. But. We have a new era now, and there are new developments, there are new opportunities. The open graph is a significant part of that, and, uh, and that's really what, what Wade had spoken um, about much of this morning. Um, but if I had to step back and look at what is it about the issues that didn't work in the past that now have changed, it's almost the, the exact antithesis of the challenges now being addressed and the shortcomings now becoming strengths. And the first and foremost difference is really the capability to customize and to be able to put new buttons that consumers or brand enthusiasts can now um, use to really highlight the emotions that they have about a particular brand. And, and we saw many of them earlier today, and we saw them actually customized in really unique ways for brands as diverse as those in the luxury world to those who are more contemporary and fun. Um, but these are just the examples of, uh, of, of some of that, that diversity and the ability to customize everything from not just the verbiage to the font to the color. Um, all of those ultimately lead to that ability of the brand to really provide the level of expression that, that they had probably always sought and that, that many of um, any brand's brand enthusiasts ultimately um, you know, are likely to respond to. The second and third point, again, go back to you know, how much volume and how much more product discovery results um, as a result of, of not just these, um, these new messages that can be communicated, but also just the seamlessness of sharing and the ability to take advantage of consumers who may already be logged in without having to explicitly force an additional set of keystrokes in order to encourage that login. Um, that really encourages a significant part 
part of the, the sharing that happens. We see that on sites like the Washington Post or Spotify. Um, and what results from that is the greater discovery, the richer, more frequent sharing that ultimately happens, where as a consumer just simply, you know, kind of uh, pins something or says that they like something or they say that they want something, that that just automatically goes. And it, uh, it has that capability of, of really, really amplifying the amount of, of views and the, ultimately the amount of traffic that comes back to a given site. And, uh, and that's really, you know, kind of some of the data that, um, that I thought replicated that and, and, and kind of reinforced some of that information that we had talked about earlier. Just a couple of examples, and this is publicly available information that, uh, that I just pulled from Compete.com, but a couple of uh, illustrations of companies that in particular saw some of that explosion of traffic as a result of some of this, this usage of uh, the custom open graph and the ability to have some of that seamless sharing um, were in the Washington Post and fab.com, and I'll talk about both of them separately. In the case of the Washington Post, which is a really, really interesting example, um, because it is a traditional media company, which, you know, like so many media players, you know, just has challenges with attracting traffic and, and in the world of, of fragmented media, um, really continuing to drive a significant amount of traffic, which, of course, is, is ultimately the, the objective of, uh, of that site. But if you look at around the time when the open graph was implemented, around the, the um, fall, the late summer, early fall time period, we see a consistent growth in traffic to that site. And uh, there were some spikes earlier in the year, but you know, kind of inconsistent with you know, kind of the trend. But when we see, you know, kind of as a result of, of the open graph implementation, um, that consistent growth upward, that's what's really remarkable. Because then what you go back to is that this is the, the earlier part of the year. This is a year later um, from the beginning to the end, an enormous growth in year over year traffic that is not only kind of a consistent upward trend, but a significant overall growth in the volume that that, that site sees. Um, in the case of a retail player like fab.com, um, flash sale site that uh, you, you know, kind of uh, also has a lot of great photography and a lot of great images, also around the same time when they started to implement you know, kind of the ability to have the seamless sharing of images and you know, kind of liking something or you know, kind of sharing something um, and just promoting it to, to one's uh, social network, we also see this explosion in traffic that just literally happens over a very, very short period of time. And, uh, and that's, that's really what um, kind of the takeaway here is, is that, is that this, is, this is the big so what of, of all of this, is that the amount of traffic generation, the amount of volume that consistently these sites have been able to generate as a result of of their own fans, their own brand enthusiasts, essentially sharing the word about specific products and ultimately about the company, um, that's what this is really ultimately a reflection of. Now, the fourth part, which is perhaps one of the most important components here, is that now we also have the capability of having data become a bigger part of the ROI equation. And the reason that I say that is that when we even step back and look at, you know, kind of what are all of the, the capabilities that Facebook has to offer to a brand or specifically to, to a retailer, I bucket it into three different places. We bucket it into everything that's on Facebook. And that was kind of, you know, social commerce version 1.0, where it was everything that was happening within the metaphorical four walls of Facebook. It was the Facebook stores, Facebook fan pages. And I kind of put it at the bottom of this, this chart here because for the most part, this was also where the least value to a lot of retailers came. And that was all of the things that, that Wade had referred to this morning that were some of those challenges. Now, we started to see more value, and that's where a lot of this kind of sharing um, and the traffic value is coming from, where we see a lot of the off Facebook capabilities. It's all of the, the, um, the, 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 the customization of the, the buttons and the sharing that comes as a result of that, that we're, we're seeing kind of going up in the ladder. But where I really see some of the most value to actually come out of this in, and where I think that there's the greatest level of, of opportunity is in the data layer. And it's looking at all of the information that consumers are now sharing with you and taking advantage of that 
in every way that it can be taken advantage of. So it's looking at things like, well, where are there product development opportunities? Or where are things trending? So really looking at you know, kind of how you can take advantage of the information that then ends up um, as a result of, uh, of, of, of a lot of the sharing and, uh, and, and taking advantage of it in one's own way. Um, and the reason why so much of the value and the ROI part of the equation needs to come through the data piece is, is frankly, it's because of um, you know, kind of what the so what here of this data is, which is the reality is, is that even though there's a lot of traffic that often is coming to these sites, and we saw the examples uh, like fab.com and the Washington Post of, of traffic resulting from sharing, much of that is very top of the funnel traffic. It's about discovery and it's about um, consumers realizing that something exists where they may not have realized it before. Um, the challenge is ultimately how that leads to and ultimately drives transactions. And when we actually explicitly ask people, and this was sort of a couple of months, probably a couple of, yeah, it was probably a few months into um, kind of the, the initial custom graph implementations kind of coming about, um, pretty consistently, very, very few consumers actually ultimately complete transactions as a result of explicitly having seen a link from a social network. Um, and that's what the data here really reflects, is that this was holiday data last year, looking at people who had purchased during a very specific period of time. And the big takeaway is that you know ultimately, when we look at what is the interactive marketing tactic that can be related to that sale, it typically is either email or consumers just visiting a site organically. Um, but that obviously doesn't mean that the social experience was not relevant to that because we know that there's a significant amount of upstream traffic that these sites are now generating. The challenge is how do you tie that back to the sale? So there are two ways to do that. One is that you basically broaden the attribution window so that it's no longer a 14 or a 30 day window, but you broaden that time frame to several months because that's likely what the, uh, the time period is between um, discovery to actually transaction. Um, but the other value is looking at how else can you take advantage of the information that you've gleaned from that sharing. And, uh, and what else does that tell you about how things are trending, what, po what items are popular, what items do consumers want to see more of, what items are ultimately shareable. Um, and when we look at sort of, you know, kind of how, how do you make sure that you're making the most out of kind of social commerce 2.0, um, really taking advantage of, of what is there for, um, for, for, for the best of, of, of all worlds, it's, uh, it's these four things. One is, is that ultimately you have to honestly assess the viral nature of your products. And to make the most of a good social sharing platform, you realize that not all products are necessarily viral and not all products are viral in the same way. And certain um, types of, uh, of, of marketing messages may resonate more in certain types of forums like Twitter versus Facebook versus Pinterest. Um, and taking advantage of, of understanding what it is that's fundamentally viral. Um, realizing that certain types of brands um, definitely attract much more um, energy and enthusiasm and certain types of products simply may not. And, uh, and to recognize that, uh, that, that you need to take advantage of the ones that, that certainly have more of a viral component because not every product does. Um, the second is how important it is for a brand marketer themselves to seed and feed the good content. And what that means is taking advantage of knowing what are those best products and putting it out there yourself so that so that that kind of gets the, you know, it's kind of the, you know, kind of stoking the, 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 the embers and, uh, and getting it out there so that it's not just kind of left to its own. You do definitely need to, to cultivate the experience and to ensure that people do know what, uh, what it is that is definitely worth sharing. The third point is to recognize and reward your power users. Um, and the value there is to make sure that some of those brand enthusiasts recognize that they're loved, that they are being listened to, that they're adding value. Because the worst thing that, and one of the, the common experiences that we often even saw in Social Commerce 1.0 was that we would often see these brand enthusiasts participating, but then if they themselves didn't get the recognition or they didn't get necessarily the feedback from the company that they were providing value, they'd either go to another format or they would stop 
participating at the level that they were participating in. And those power users are incredibly critical for not only seeding the content, but continuing to keep um, the enthusiasm going. We, we typically know that a minority, usually around 20% or so, of those people, of the shares that happen, um, typically are gonna come from, from you know, kind of that minority. Look, I should say the, major, the majority of shares typically come from a minority like a percent or in, in the neighborhood of 20% of the, the, the users. The last bit is uh, to monitor behavior, and this is where the data piece comes in, to continue to monitor behavior, match any data that you have back to your master customer file so that you can get to that level of the data layer extraction and the data layer intelligence, which is so important for not only continuing to grow your brand, but also to think about how you can continue to grow wallet share and acquire new customers. Um, and with that, I will uh, thank you for your time, and uh, hopefully you found this, this valuable and useful. This is my contact information, and uh, I will give the microphone back to Wade. Thank you.